The following program is made possible by the faithful friends and supporters of Higher Aim. Man, I can't wait for you to hear this message because I know God has invited you to watch today. I really believe that. Our God is a miracle working God and, and some of us right now desperately, desperately need one. Stay tuned. Now the passage that we are in is the description of uniqueness. It is a beautiful description of the earthly ministry of Jesus revealing to us the character and nature of God. And in this verse that we're about to read, which is the last verse in the prologue of John's gospel, we capture that Jesus is God's show and tell. Why don't you follow along with me? Here's what the scripture says. No one has ever seen God. In fact, in the Greek language, it goes like this. God, no one has ever seen. The emphasis is on God. No one has ever seen with a human eye. He, he's an invisible God. But the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in, the, in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. This last phrase, has made him known, means to draw out in a narrative a descriptive word and action about who God is. And so this is the springboard, if you will, into the rest of John's gospel. What Jesus is doing in John's gospel is to reveal who God is and what he looks like. Now, I need to tell you that this one message that God has given me uh, from this one verse has turned into a mini-series in itself because there's no way in the world we can get through the, in the entirety of John's gospel in one setting, and so therefore I'm not even going to try. And we have already spent quite a bit of time looking at uh, several different chapters. We've gone all the way through chapter 5 to pull principles that are very important. But now we're in chapter 6, and I want to give you only two this morning. Two more principles, if you will, two more characteristics, two more uh, show and tells of who God is, because you're going to need it. You may need it not only today, but you're going to need it for the days to come, because this is very, very important. We, we meet Jesus in John chapter 6, and out of John chapter 6, multiple uh, dimensions of the character of God and the description of how God works are there. And one of them can be described like this. Here it is. God can take your little and multiply it. God can take your little and multiply it. In fact, quite honestly, it's sometimes not our great abilities and our successes that we feel like God is bound to put on showcase for us to use for his glory. We've learned this, and so God wants to use that. Or I've experienced this great thing in my life, and God wants to use that. Rather, sometimes it is the insignificant things, the small pain, the, the, the small relationship that, that was broken that God healed that he would use in the lives of other people for the days to come. Never discount that, because that's what God does. I, I remember when I was in my first year of seminary, I went to the mountains for a retreat um, and a seminar or two and, and met this guy that, um, that was from our denomination, and, and a bunch of the young seminary students uh, had a chance just to visit with him. And Have you ever met someone that the way they talked to you and the way they connected, uh, you just felt at, at home with them, and, and, and you were free to just, you just opened up your life to them. And uh, he was one of those guys, and he, he 
uh, began to talk to me, and he, he just said, why don't you tell me your story? And because it was my favorite subject, me, I began to unpack that and, and uh, told him of my journey, of my starts and stops, my making commitments to follow Christ, and then how often I would pull back and get in the flesh again and, and then bring them all up to date and say, and God's called me into ministry, and this is where I am now to prepare. And instead of applause, he looked at me and he said these words, Kurt, have you ever thought that God was about to put you aside because of your lack of commitment to Christ and you're stalling and you're stopping and you're stalling and you're stopping and he was about to put you aside and look for another person that he could bless but because of the faithful prayers of some little old lady that was praying for you from your church when you were growing up that God had placed you on her heart, God said, I'll give him another chance. I'll never forget that. And you know what? I think he's right. I'm looking forward to meeting that little old lady one day, knowing that what she may have thought were insignificant small prayers on behalf of a student that for some reason her eye caught <laughs> has made all the difference in the world in my life and my ministry. And anyone that God has ever used me to win to Christ, she shares in that. Never minimize, never discount your little because God can take your little and multiply it. If that's the only thing you walk away with today, it'd be worth it all. Don't discount it. But there's much more in chapter 6, and I'm going to give you one more in chapter 6 because here's, here's what happens with the rest of the story. He feeds thousands of people. And people are wowed that this happens. And later on, they're going to follow him across the, uh, the sea. But um, he dismisses the crowd, but he sends the disciples ahead in a boat. He said, I'll see you on the other side. He dismisses the crowd. They get in the boat, and they're on the Sea of, of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. And by the way, it's really not a sea. It's a freshwater lake, but it's a big one. And it's right just west of the Golan Heights, which is a mountain range that goes from uh, Syria, Lebanon, all the way down uh, towards southern Israel. And the, the winds will come off the Golan Heights and sweep down uh, onto the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it can turn that flat water, uh, beautiful, pristine lake into a raging uh, dangerous sea. Uh, I love going there and love taking people with me because we often, uh, there in Tiberias, we'll get on something they call a Jesus boat and we'll set sail on this wooden boat uh, large enough to carry our entire group and go out on the lake and uh, worship the Lord and I'll, I'll read that story that I've just told you about and, uh, and then we'll go over to uh, 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 to the area where uh, Guinnessor, over near Magdala, in that same area. But there have been times that I've not been able to go out on the Sea of Galilee because the winds will come up, and it'll be so violent that uh, one time it did damage to some of the hotels there on the Sea of Galilee. It can get that violent. And it was in that kind of violent, rough water storm that the Bible tells us the disciples were in the boat. Jesus wasn't with them, but he comes and he walks to them on the water. He calms the water and gets in the boat with them. Let me give you this principle. Here it is. God is not limited to the natural laws of the universe. You know why? He's God. Now, watch this. God uses the natural laws, but he is not obligated to use them. 
He made them, but sometimes he chooses to operate outside the natural laws that he set in motion. You know what a miracle is? A miracle is when God chooses to operate outside a natural law. That's what a miracle is. It's where he does something that is inexplicable logically. Now, that doesn't mean to say God doesn't use logic. He uses logic. But sometimes he chooses to operate outside how we think he ought to operate. You know why? Because he's God. He set things in motion to operate like he wants, but sometimes he chooses to do things outside the norm. We can't get our mind around it. We don't understand it. Sometimes he supersedes science, but you've got to remember he created science. <laughs> sometimes uh, we can add two plus two, and we go, that's four, but sometimes God goes, okay, I'm going to add something to this equation. And he multiplies it just like we've just seen. But God is not limited to natural laws. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is a bunch of you need a miracle. You need a miracle. You'd be surprised how many of us in this place actually need a miracle. We need God to intervene. Maybe it's in a relationship that we have thought that could never be healed. Or there's a miracle that, that we need to, for God to do something in our life physically or in the life of someone we care about deeply where the doctors have given up total hope and it doesn't seem to compute and the inevitable of death would eventually happen. Or there's a need for a job in your life financially, and, uh, and you've worked so hard, and you've ended up with so little. And if God doesn't come through and change the heart of someone that you're interviewing with, you'll have another hopeless week. Or maybe you've had enough hopeless weeks you find yourself so depressed and you wonder, does God really even know that you exist? And you're just asking for a miracle. Anybody here like that? Let me ask you again. How many of you would honestly, transparently say, I personally am in need and desire a miracle for either me or somebody I love, and I really want to see it happen. That's me. You see all those hands? What does that say? Where you are has not caught God off balance. Like he's up in heaven going, oh, no, what happened? He knows where you are. And isn't it curious how many of us right now, either we need a miracle in our family, we need a miracle in our finances, or we need a miracle in our friendships, or we just need a miracle for God to do something in our life. And we're longing for that. And we're wondering, God, are you still working like that? And I've got to tell you, yes, he is. And there's not anything that you're going through that God cannot use how he has positioned you right now in your family situation, in your finances, in, in your professional situation that he cannot use to show you that he is God. When the disciples saw him walk on water, you need to realize that it didn't heal one person, save one person, but it it's done because Jesus knew those men would need to remember that story because they would need that memory to carry them all the way through when the times got really tough. I'm going to tell you a story that I've told you before, but this morning, even though I was not planning to use it, God just said, Kurt, I want you to tell the story again. 
It's about my family. Uh, my wife has always been challenged physically. Uh, uh, her childbearing years were never really uh, uh, without uh, discomfort. Uh, and she, she had back problems in such a way that uh, finally they found through some x-rays that she had herniated disc at L4 and L5. They're in her early 30s. Um, but it didn't get any better. It wouldn't get any better. Um, and so finally the doctor said, we need to find out a little more. So they did a, either a CAT scan or MRI or both I, because they wanted to see what was happening in all the levels. That was on a Friday. And Friday about noon, I got a call after she had done the test on that morning from our family physician who was one of my best friends who taught at Baylor Medical School. And he said, Kurt, uh, the test came back. And I said, okay. And his voice began to quiver a little bit and he said, in that same area where she has a herniated disc at L4, L5, they've discovered a mass about the size of a grapefruit or softball. And he said, Kurt, uh, it's in all the layers of the pictures. This is not a shadow. It is in multiple layers in this scan. And they have scheduled a biopsy for Monday. And I said, David, what's the prognosis? And here's what my physician said. We've got to pray. He said, Kurt, the x-ray that was done in Ginger's back three months ago didn't reveal this. And if this mass has grown this fast, this quick, in three months, we may not have her on this planet in the next month or so. We've got to pray. I said, thank you, and hung up the phone and found myself shaking. I'd left the office and went home, and there Ginger was, uh, laying back in bed with the pillows propped behind her back. And I said, Ginger, I got called about the results from the test. And she said, okay. I said, here's the deal. You, you have herniated disc at L4, L5, but they have found a mass the size of a grapefruit. I didn't tell her about the prognosis. And her response to me was, see, I told you I was sick. <laughs> and you who know her can hear her attitude. And she said, what's next? I said, they're going to do a biopsy on Monday morning. It's Friday. Don't you hate it when things happen on Friday and you have to wait until Monday to find out everything? So I hugged her and I just began to pray. As I prayed for, for healing, a thought occurred to me that unless God comes through here, this may be one of the last times I will have the privilege of praying with my wife. I did my best to hold it together. Went to church on Sunday to preach a sermon like I normally would do. And at the end of the service, I said, before I dismiss you, I, I just need to tell you what we're walking through. And I told them. And I said, I want you to pray that God would heal my wife miraculously. And I want you to pray in Jesus' name, believing that God will heal my wife. And this is going out on, on live radio. It's going out on television at this moment. And I said, and I pray that God would heal her, but we believe that he either will heal her or give us the grace to walk through next steps for his glory. I said, so church family, would you pray right now? A lot of churches, we, we pray for people to be healed physically as long as it's during the middle of the week, and number two, they're not there. 
but we prayed for my wife right then and there. Dismissed the crowd and went home. Hers was the first biopsy of the morning. And so we got to the medical center. They rode her in with a gurney and uh, met the, the physician who was going to do the biopsy. And he said, we want to take some pictures first to uh, just verify exact locations before we mark and do the biopsy. And it took a little more time, longer than we normally thought it would be. And the door swung open, and the physician looked at me, and he said, would you come in here for a moment? I said, yes, sir, I'll be glad to. And he said, look at this. And he put up the, the scans from Friday and the scans of the morning, and he said, I don't, under, I don't understand this. I don't even get this. This is the same back. Notice the herniated disc in L4, L5, same back. But he said this mass that was clearly there on multiple layers, on multiple frames, this is not a shadow that was there on Friday. It is nowhere to be seen right now. It is gone. We don't know what is going on here. He said, I cannot explain this. This is outside my realm of understanding because it's very clear. There was something there. There is nothing there. I don't get it, but I did. My wife was hearing this conversation, and she says, am I going to get a biopsy or what? <laughs> and the physician looked at her, and he said, honey, there's nothing in there to biopsy. You can go home. Let me just tell you something. Our God is not limited to the natural laws of the universe. He is a miracle-working God, and he can work in the friendships that have been crushed in your life. He can work in your finances that have been ravaged with the economy and bad mistakes. He can put together the explosion of a relationship that has just come apart and a lot of water gone under the bridge, and yes, he can override medical understanding with his supreme, powerful power. You know why? Because he's not limited to doing what natural laws say, because he is a miracle-working God. But sometimes the greatest miracle is what he is doing in your life when the miracle doesn't come and someone sees how you handle with peace and confidence that God's in charge regardless of what he does. And sometimes the impact of an unanswered prayer for a miracle has a greater impact than the answered prayer for a miracle. You see, it's about the kingdom of God, and you need to remember, he's not limited to the natural laws of this universe. And some of us are in a place right now, as students, adults, young families, older adults, and yeah, even middle-aged people. It seems like all of our lives, there are moments where uh, we're really needing, not just wanting, we're needing the intervention, the hand of God. That story's in there in John chapter 6 because you need it today. You saw all the hands. And there are many of you who are watching by television across this nation, and you are in need of a miracle. It'd be great if you could just say, God, give me a miracle in Jesus' name, and whammo, it happens. But that may or may not be the case that God will do that for you. But let me just tell you something. He is right here, right now, right here. And if you're willing to listen to him and respond to him, he'll give you the kind of miracle that you need and that he desires. Remember, everyone Jesus ever healed eventually had to die but all oh, the stories that God can use in our lives 
when we lean back on him and ask him to do what only he could do. In just a moment, Dr. Dodd will return with a closing thought. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. As you follow along with this series, we would love for you to take advantage of the free sermon guide we've created just for you. This guide contains an overview of this week's sermon, summaries of Dr. Dodd's key points, and questions to consider at the close of the message. This sermon guide is completely free and can be downloaded straight from our website. To get your free sermon guide, go to higheraim.org and click the button at the top that says download your free show and tell sermon guide. We hope this will be a helpful tool that encourages you in your walk with the Lord as we study God's word together. I am so glad that you have been watching today and I just need to say what I said in the message. I wanna say it to you right now who are watching at this particular time. You need Jesus. And the way that you receive him is to turn from your sin and place your faith in Christ. You need to ask him. Remember Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you ever done that? Or have you just asked God to save you out of this problem or that problem? Have you truly invited Christ to take charge of your life? Have you become a Christ follower? Or are you just instead just reading the book? I pray that God would intervene in your life right now and give you the want to, to give your life to Christ. Oh, that's where it starts. Regardless of how broken you may feel, let me just tell you, you're not so far away that God couldn't change your life right now. Remember that. I want to invite you to call us. Would you do that? The number's on the screen. Maybe you want to write to us. The address is on the screen as well. But I pray that, you, that the decision that God's calling you to make, that you would make right now and connect with us. Would you? And we want to invite you to stay connected to us by going to higheraim.org and signing up for our newsletter that comes out, our teaching letter every month, uh, or our daily devotions. Uh, by the way, you ought to try downloading our app. It's just one more way to, of staying connected with great encouragement. And that's exactly why we're here, to encourage you to come to Christ and stay walking with Jesus. So until next time, keep walking with with Christ. God bless you. Thank you for joining us on Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. For more information and free resources, please visit us at higheraim.org. The preceding program was brought to you by the faithful supporters of Higher Aim.